Oh, how y'all doing? Wow, that was weak. How are you guys doing? All right, all right, that was great. Okay, hey, I need uh, four brave volunteers. I need two guys and two girls to come play a game with me. Okay, let's see. Let's do one, two, Aiden is one, two, one more guy. Okay, right there. I was just saying that, make a check for Okay, you guys come on this side. Yeah, yeah, you and the sunglasses. You don't want to go? Okay, all right, you can come in. Okay, we're going to play a game real quick. No, no, over here, over here. I have my cheat sheet here. Um, we're going to play uh, Guess That Person game, okay? Here we go. Here, don't back away. I won't bite. And, uh, hey, the winner of this game is going to get uh, a Patriot Academy hat, okay? So, so the stakes are very high. Okay, so uh, the rules are simple. I'm going to show a slide. The first person to raise their hand uh, is going to get to guess who the person is, okay? And we'll do, like, I think 15 or something. Um, and then whoever has the most by the end will win the game, okay? Sound good? All right, and then you guys are going to help me uh, judge who gets their hand up first. All right, so if it's really close, I'm going to call on you guys to help me, and, y and y'all uh, y'all help me quick uh, pick one. Okay, wait, names real quick. Faith, Aiden, and Connor. Okay, all right, you guys ready? Okay. Here's the first one. Here we go. If it'll work. Oh, wait. Maybe if I turn my clicker on, it'll work. Here we go. Oh. Aiden. Aiden? That's right. Tom Cruise. Okay. <laughs> A AKA what? Maverick. What? This is celebrities. Starting off with celebrities, okay? You don't really need categories. You should just guess who they are. All right. This is going to be two people. You ready? Who are these people? Aiden again? Mm. <laughs> okay, you don't get another guess. Uh, Faith. Faith. You're so close. Come on. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, Connor. <laughs> you got a guess? Okay, we'll move on. Nobody got that one. Okay. All right, here we go. Next person. Next person. Aiden. <laughs> Aiden. All right. All right, Taylor Swift. That's two for Aiden. Two for Aiden. All right, here's another uh, two people at a time. Who are these people? <laughs> was that Aiden? It was? Okay. Uh, that's right. That's right. All right, that's three for Aiden. Okay. Uh, we're going to go back in time a little bit, not too far back, but we're going to go back a little bit in time. Who is this person? Mm, you halfway went. Faith went all the way. Okay. That's Jackie Robinson. Yes. All right. So one for Faith, three for Aiden. Okay. Next person. Here we go. Oh, that was really close here. Who'd y'all have here? That was like a tie, man. Faith? Faith? Okay, y'all do rock, paper, scissors, because I don't know who won that. Okay, no, no, you won that. You won that. That was scissors and paper. Okay, so who is that? Okay, but you got to guess. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice, nice, nice. All right. One, one, three, or do you have two? One. Okay. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Next person. Aiden. Aiden? That's right. That's right. All right. Next person. Faith. Rosa Parks. Uh, four, two, and one. Connor, you gotta, you gotta pay attention, bro. <laughs> you can still catch up. If you get all five of these, you'll win. All right, next person. Here we go. Mm. Whoops. Don't pay attention to what happened. Okay. Uh, who was that? I don't know. Aiden, you keep going like halfway and then committing. Guys, who did y'all? Who do y'all think it was? Okay, good. Is that C.S. Lewis? Yes, nice, nice. All right, going back in time a little more. Here we go. Hand at your side to start. All right, I see you cheaters. Here we go. 
All right, that's Washington. Good job, good job. All right, next person. Was it Aiden? Okay, uh, Aiden, go ahead. Yes. You need to start with your hand behind your back or something. Is he going early? Like, is he starting early? Make sure you start when you see the person, okay? All right, uh, next person. Nobody? Aiden. Mm, close, but no. Come on. You can do it. He said that. He said that. Um, yes, John Hancock. Good job. Good job. All right. Uh, Hi, Faith, how many do you have? Three? Aiden, you've got like 20? Okay, five? Okay, yeah, Connor. <laughs> All right, uh, next person, next person here. Mmm, that was a tie between Aiden and, and Faith. Was it, was it Aiden? Was it Faith? Faith? Okay, Faith. Paul Revere, that is right. All right, last person. You got to be quick with this one. I don't know if you're going to get this. <laughs> I think you went early again, dude. <laughs> okay, Connor, who was <laughs> That is buff Jesus right there. Amen, brother. All right, I think Caden, uh, Aiden, you won, buddy. Good job. Here's your hat, sir. Adorn it with honor. All right. Goodness. Y'all look crazy. Okay. All right, you guys ready? We are going to talk about biblical citizenship in modern America. What does it look like as a Christian to be a citizen in America? Um, I want to start first by looking at the state of the nation. Um, in order to, to treat a patient, you have to look at him. Right, you got to diagnose what's, what's wrong before you can actually treat a patient. And so we're going to do that with the nation real quick. Um, it's Pride Month, and progressive and radical sexual and gender ideology is coming for you for the next generation. Transgender activism is only growing in the nation's approval of it as well. In less than a decade, guys, we went from transgenderism being the thing that was still kind of done in the shadows to now having kids full-on participate with drag shows. That just happened in uh, Houston, Texas, not too long ago. Thankfully, Roe v. Wade was just overturned. Praise God for that, yes. Amen, amen. But there's still a lot of work to be done because now that is gonna go back to the states and each state is gonna decide for themselves what they're gonna do for abortion uh, law. And so we're, that fight still exists. We still have to be a part of that. Um, we are dealing with school shootings. Our government is completely out of control. It's surpassing many of its jurisdictions. Incompetent officials are the cause of massive inflation. That's why gas is so expensive right now, and uh, the American people are left hurting financially because of it. Trust in our government is at an all-time low. And uh, I'll say throughout 2020 and still to this day, we saw a mass wave of churches bow the knee to government. Uh, out of fear, instead of obeying God's word to not forsake the fellowship, closing their churches all throughout COVID. And there's a lot more going on, um, but you get the idea. The state of our nation is not that great right now. So how did we get here? The short answer is we got rid of the Bible in the public square. You say, Reagan, what do you mean by that? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Um, Supreme Court case Ingle v. Vitel, 1962, said that devotional prayer in school was unconstitutional. The year after that, in Abington School District versus Shemp, 1963, said that reading the Bible, or just having the Bible, really, in school, was unconstitutional. Now, to this day, no one has been able to show me where in the Constitution it says that, because it doesn't. The, the Constitution has no restrictions on religious practices in school. And that's, of course, with the understanding of what the First Amendment means. So let's read the First Amendment. Here's what it says. This is just the beginning of it. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And then it names a few more freedoms, but that's the, uh, the religious part. So does that mean that we can't prohibit 
any practices in school? No. We don't want people practicing Sharia law in our school and whipping women and cutting off the heads of Christians. Obviously, that violates their natural and civil rights. But you reading your Bible in school, that how, that somehow violates the First Amendment? Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because we believe the lie about separation of church and state. Josh just mentioned it this morning. So uh, who can tell me where we get this phrase, separation of church and state? Yes. Bingo. Uh, Jefferson wrote a letter to the Danbury Baptist Association in 1802. And the Danbury Baptist Association wrote a letter to Jefferson first, uh, soon after he was elected president in 1801 expressing concern about a lack of religious protection in their state of Connecticut and a fear that there would be a state-established religion. So Jefferson writes them back, assuring them that no, Connecticut cannot do that. The First Amendment is explicitly clear when it says that there cannot be a state-established religion. Um, that was the intent, the expressed intent of his letter. In, if you go read the letter, and it's real short, and I encourage you to go read it, in no way was Jefferson saying that religion, your religion does not... In, can't be involved in politics, can't be involved in the state. He was simply expressing the fact that the state cannot inhibit your practices of religion and it cannot make a state religion. We don't want a state religion. We don't want a Church of England. That's what we fled from. The beauty about America is that you can believe whatever you want to believe. Uh, let's see here. Now the phrase separation of church and state, that's been referenced by the Supreme Court over and over and over again. And so now it's become largely the opinion of most government officials that the phrase means religion does not belong in politics or the public square or the state. Uh, they cite the Establishment Clause. What is that and where is that in the Constitution? Well, it comes from the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment, there's that word, of religion. But the wording of the First Amendment is clearly stating that the church can't, well, it's not stating that the church can't be involved in politics or education or the public square. It's just saying that the state can't make a state-sponsored religion where everyone has to follow it. That was the only thing in there that the founders wanted you to understand. Okay, quick recap. Uh, so America's not in a good place. Why? Because we got rid of the Bible in the public square. Why did we do that? Because we believed that lie about separation of church and state. But boom, I just gave you a rebuttal for that. So don't believe the lie. Okay, uh, let's see. If you go out to your vehicle or your truck and you look in your glove compartment on the passenger side, there's a big little thick book in there. A big little thick book? There's a <laughs> thick book right in there. What is that? The manual for your vehicle. And uh, who wrote that manual? The maker of the truck, the designer of the truck, the manufacturer of that truck. Well, let's say that for some reason one day I'm feeling a little bit rebellious and I'm going to go fill up my truck. Uh, and as I'm pulling into the gas station, I pull out my manual. This manual lays out uh, how I should treat my truck, how I need to take care of it so that it can best operate how the manufacturer wanted it to. But I just toss that manual out the window. I don't want to follow that manual. Um, why should I follow what other people are telling me to do? It's my truck. I can do whatever I want with my truck. So I pull into the gas station, and uh, on this day, you know, I, I feel like my truck should be a diesel. In fact, I'm going to start transitioning my truck into a diesel so that it can really be who it's, I want to identify as. So I fill up my truck, I bought a gas truck, I fill up my truck with diesel, well how far am I getting out of that driveway? Not very far. I'm not gonna bash on your truck again, Colton. <laughs> Guys, the Bible is the instruction manual for life. It's the instruction manual for how we are supposed to live according to how God designed us. Um, it talks about every, everything in life. It talks about family, it talks about politics, it talks about foreign relationships with other nations, immigration, uh, taxation, uh, everything. But for some reason, we are a nation now that doesn't want to live according to the Bible. So what happens when you throw out the instruction manual? Noah Webster said, all the miseries and evils which men suffer from vice, crime, ambition, injustice, oppression, slavery, and war proceed from their despising or neglecting the precepts in the Bible. So what's he, say what's he saying? You want all that bad suffering, that painful stuff in your nation, just don't teach the Bible. Just get rid of the Bible and you will have all that evil suffering, okay? And humans are flawed. We need direction. The Bible is direction to the Lord and how he wants us to live our lives because he designed us. He's the manufacturer of us, the same way that manufacturers of a truck created a manual. God created a manual right here for us, the Bible. 
when you get rid of the instruction manual, you see an attack on truth, on the absolute never-ending reality of truth, especially in today's culture. Uh, no one wants to follow truth. We want our own truth. We want our personal opinion to be the truth. And worse than that, we want you to accept my personal opinion of truth no matter what. How selfish of us. Well, after 60 years of not having the Bible in school, uh, here is how people view truth in America. Okay, here's some statistics. Y'all ready? Three in five Americans believe that there is no absolute moral truth. That's more than half of us believe that there's no absolute moral truth. Okay? Four in five millennials believe that there is no absolute moral truth. So generationally, or yeah, generationally, that trend is not going in the right direction. The younger we get, the less we're believing in absolute moral truth. All right, here's a shocker. One in two Christians believe that there is no absolute moral truth. Okay, here's how bad it is in the Christian community. 80% of Christians surveyed believe that a re uh, religions other than Christianity will get an individual into heaven. Uh, if you've read the Bible, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But 80% of Christians surveyed believe that a religion other than Christianity will get them into heaven. That does not add up. Uh, let's see. 42% of Christians surveyed believe that a belief in atheism will get a person into heaven. I dare someone to try to explain this to me. You don't believe in God, so you're going to spend eternity with him. How does that work? 56% of Christians surveyed believe that a belief in no religion will get someone into heaven. Okay, so this is the result of 60 years of taking the Bible out of school, taking the Bible out of the public square, and taking God out of the public square. And you also combine that with a church that cares more about putting butts in seats than it does seeing people's lives change. That, that's an equation for failure, for a degrading society. Okay, uh, let's talk about some consequences for not believing in truth. Let's take uh, gravity, for example. Um, gravity is, a, is a, an absolute law of nature. It's not changing. It's not going anywhere, and it hasn't ever changed. But let's say that I don't want to believe in the, in the law of gravity one day. And, uh, in fact, the law of gravity offends me. I had nothing to say with it. Why should I, again, like with the manual of my truck, why should I believe a law that someone else uh, came up with? I'm, I want to live my life how I want to live my life. And, in fact, I, I, uh, I want to I start identifying as Superman. And so I believe that I'm, I'm Superman. I'm going to go up to the top of a skyscraper, and I'm going to jump off and fly like Superman. Well, what's going to happen when I jump off that skyscraper? I'm going to fall right to my death, and I'm going to die. Right? Okay, that was my consequence for not believing in an absolute moral truth, a law of nature that does not change. Okay, so here's some uh, societal consequences for not believing in an absolute moral truth. You get things like abortion, okay? And again, we just referenced that. Uh, we gotta keep fighting that because the fight's not over. Um, it's still an evil that exists in the nation and it's gonna be here until it's eradicated or Jesus comes back. Um, you get things like sex trafficking, okay? And that should really be called the rape trade of little kids, because that's what it is. It's the rape trade of little kids, okay? That's just a nice way of putting it. You get record-breaking number of inner-city shootings and murders. You get school shootings, mass murders. You get biological men stealing athletic opportunities from girls, being allowed into girls' locker rooms. And then, oh my goodness, shocker, we're, we're shocked when, you know, a boy goes into a girl's locker room wearing a skirt and then rapes her. What did you think was going to happen? These are all consequences of not believing in an absolute truth. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, test everything, hold on to what is good. How can you know what is good when you don't have an absolute moral standard of goodness? How can you test anything if you don't have an absolute standard that's not changing that you can compare things to? Right? We have to get back to an absolute moral truth that comes from God and his word and does not change. Okay, let's get into some biblical arguments for getting involved in politics. Charles Finney was a theologian in the Second Great Awakening, and uh, this is what he said. He said, the church must take right ground in regards to politics. Politics are a part of a religion in a country such as this. Christians must do their duty to their country as a part of their duty to God. God will bless or curse this nation according to the course Christians take in politics. You can basically sum that up in saying that 
God is going to bless or curse a nation based on what the church does. And the church, the body of Christ, was never meant to just stay within the four walls of a building. All right, we are meant to take the gospel and God's truth into every arena of our society. Uh, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. If we are to teach people everything that Jesus taught and teach them to obey that, guess what? Jesus talked about politics. The Bible talks about politics. So we can't exclude that just because it's a touchy subject or people don't want it's to, a, it's a swamp and it's full of corrupt people. Yeah, it is. Maybe because Christians have eradicated that arena. And we need to get back in there and make, and make some changes. Uh, Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, oh, I'm behind all my slides. There we go. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. The word that Jesus used for church there was ecclesia. Okay? This word, liter it quite literally translates to mean the public or the political assembly. The public assembly. Again, why would Jesus use that word? Because the church is not supposed to be just within the four walls of your building. You're suppo it's supposed to be a community aspect of your nation. Jesus said in Mark 12, 17, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Let me ask you a question. In America, who's Caesar? The president? Congress? We the people. First three words of the Constitution. We the people. That's you and me. We are the government. We just temporarily put people in office to run it for us. Okay? All right. So we're, as Christians, we're left with this question. Uh, how do we do Caesar in America? Okay, we have this responsibility to now be involved in our government, to be involved in our nation. How do we do that? Well, we can start by recognizing the unique freedom that we have in America and honor the sacrifice of 1.3 million men and women who gave their lives to protect that freedom. That's a great way to start, okay? Honor the sacrifice of those who died for your freedom. Yeah, go ahead. Um, but that's, that's not really enough, right? So how do you honor those men and women who died for our freedom? President Lincoln put it perfectly. He's gonna answer our question here. He said this. He said, it is from these honored dead that we take increased devotion to the cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, for the people, by the people, shall not perish from the earth. Okay, he just answered our question. You want to know how to honor those who sacrifice for freedom? He said, take an, take an increased devotion to the cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. Okay, what's the cause? What are America's founding principles? What is the formula that creates freedom in America? What's that secret sauce recipe that gives us our freedom and prosperity? Okay, if you go to a steakhouse and you get a really nice steak and, and you're, uh, maybe you're celebrating your birthday or something and it's just a really good steak. If you want to know how that steak was so good, you got to get back in the kitchen and you got to talk with the chef. You got to watch the chef cook it. You got to understand the recipe that he used to make that steak as good as it was. Okay, we're going to do the same with America. We're going to look at America's freedom, and we're going to try to understand the secret sauce recipe that creates that freedom. So I want you guys to imagine your freedom as, as a photo. It can be your church. It can be uh, you know, your house. It can be the Bible, anything. Just imagine the freedom that you enjoy in one photo. And then we're going to put our photo in a picture frame, and then we're going to hang that frame up on the wall. Let me ask you a question. If that frame goes, is your picture going to go with it? Your picture of freedom? Yeah, it's going to go with the frame. Okay, so there are principles that we get from the Bible that are the frame around our freedom. And it's holding our freedom in place. We're going to look at those principles, okay? Let me figure out where I am. Here we go. There's 56 words. So that's the freedom. And we've got a frame around it. Okay, what is the frame? What is the principles that hold our freedom in place? There's 56 words in the heart of the Declaration, and that they sum up the principles that hold our freedom together, okay? Here's what they are. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain and unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, 
and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. All right, now let's break that down because there's a lot there. Let's look at this frame. Number one, you got truths. Okay, we hold these truths. The founders believed in an absolute truth. They did not believe that truth was subjective, that it changed with the time. There was a truth that came from God's word, and it does not change. And that's what they wanted to base this government, this new nation on. Number two, uh, equality. Uh, all men are created equal. This was not equality of outcome, okay? This was equality of opportunity. Everyone in this nation, first of all, is equally valuable in the eyes of God. No man or woman is greater than another in the eyes of God in terms of equal value, intrinsic equality. But they believe that everyone should have the opportunity for prosperity, not the guarantee, but everyone has an equal opportunity to make something of themselves in this nation. Uh, number three, creator. The founders believed that God was not only a part of the equation, but he was at the center of it. And they, are, and they were endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Uh, John Adams said, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. They knew that our form of government would only work if we remained a nation that believed on moral truth and believed in a creator. Next part of that frame is life. Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Life. Founders believed in the intrinsic value of life, okay? They knew that as soon as you were conceived, you had value. You were precious, and you should be protected. Liberty. They believed that everyone had natural liberty given to them by God. And that that natural liberty should be protected through your civil liberty by the confines of a very small and restricted government, we, which is what we have today, right? No. No, we have a very out of control, big federal government that needs to be reined in. Last part of that frame, pursuit of happiness. Nowhere else in the world can you pursue your dreams like here in America, okay? Have you guys ever heard of the North Korean dream? No. Did you guys hear about that caravan of thousands of people who were trying to sneak into China? No, I don't think so. That only happens here in America. Okay, the pursuit of happiness, that's our free market system. It's your ability to make something of yourself, to pursue your dreams and not be coddled by the government throughout your life. Uh, speaking of government, Thomas Jefferson said, a wise and frugal government which shall leave men free to regulate their own pursuit of industry and improvements and shall not take from the mouth of labor bread that it has earned this is the sum of good government. So he's saying, what's a good kind of government? A government that gets out of your way and lets you pursue your dreams and make something of yourself in a free nation. Okay? You guys still with me? Yeah. All right. Okay, so those are the six principles that create the frame that is holding our freedom in, pl in place. The problem is, truth is under attack. We want to be equal in all the ways we're not. We threw God out of the equation. We said we didn't want anything to do with him. So many in our nation don't care about life and the value of it. We don't want liberty. We're allowing cultural Marxism to take over our nation from within. And Marxism fundamentally does not believe in individual liberty. And our federal government makes it incredibly difficult to pursue your own happiness because of taxation and business regulations and all that foofy stuff. All right, so what do we do as Christians? How do we fix this? Number one, pray. That is... Probably the most powerful thing that you can do. Pray for God's mercy on our nation and not his judgment. And thank God that he showed mercy through the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And that, honestly, guys, that should prove to you that we can still make progress in this nation and we can still get victories, okay? And America is not lost, all right? Because I'll be honest, like, Five years ago, I mean, I thought we were stuck with that forever. I thought there is no way in heck that Roe v. Wade is getting overturned. We're so deeply rooted in the misconception of it, and people just believe that lie that it's a law when they just made it up out of thin air. But here we are. It got overturned. So, I mean, golly, the Lord can do whatever he wants, man. All right, you have a responsibility as an American to participate in it and preserve freedom for, for future generations. Uh, here's a quote by... President James Garfield. He said, now more, and this is a little bit of a long quote, so just stick with me. He said, now more than ever before, and now more than ever, the people are responsible for the character of their Congress. He said, if that body be ignorant, reckless, and corrupt, and I know I could show slides of some congressmen, but I'm not going to do it. 
It is because the people tolerate ignorance, recklessness, and corruption. Okay? We do that all the time. Far too much. But he said, if it be intelligent, brave, and pure, how do you get that kind of Congress? Because the people demand these high qualities to represent them in the national legislature. And then he speaks to us right here in our day. He said, if the next centennial does not find us a great nation, how will that happen? It will be because those who represent the enterprise, the culture, and the morality of the nation did not aid in controlling the political forces. In other words, the church, uh, Hollywood, uh, economics, business people, they just abdicated their responsibility and let politicians do whatever they wanted to do. Okay? That's how you get a nation like we have right now. Uh, let's see. Anybody heard of the parable of the talents in Matthew 25? Okay? This... Uh, landowner, this business owner, he, he, he goes to his servants and uh, he's going to give them some money. He gives each of them, he gives each of them uh, money according to their task and then he's going to go off on a, a work trip and, and when he comes back, uh, he's going to inquire of how they used the investments that he gave them. And he said to the first two that uh, after, you know, investigating what they did, they, they invested their money, they used it, they multiplied it. He said to them, well done, good and faithful servants. Uh, he was proud of them and he gave them even more money. Um, the last one, what did he do? He buried that talent. He said, I was, I was afraid of you. I knew you'd be a harsh man, so I just buried your, your money. I didn't do anything with it. Uh, he said to that guy, you wicked and slothful servant, took his money and gave it to the one that had multiplied it more. Guys, I don't want to be that wicked and slothful servant that does not use the talent of freedom that we have here in America. I want to prosper in it, and I want to share it with people. I want to export it to other nations. Because the ideals and principles of America, they work all around the world. They don't just work here. Because they're principles that come from the Bible. And the Bible applies to the whole world. All right, let's see. I'm totally lost here. Hang on. Uh, Revelations 21.8. I love talking about this one. It lists off a bunch of people that are going to uh, go to hell, okay, that God condemns. All right, and he's got some pretty bad people up there. Faithless, detestable, murder, sexually immoral, all liars. They're all going to gonna burn in hell. There's one missing there in the beginning. Does anybody know what that one is, the first one that he lists? Yeah. No. No. Bingo. Cowards. God said he listed cowards first. That's a pretty bold statement if that's the first one that he lists. Okay? So let's not be cowardly. Let's not run away from the, the big responsibility that it is to steward this nation. Okay, because stewardship is a part of our duty as Christians. That's, that's a part of how Jesus lived. He stewarded the responsibility God gave him. We are supposed to steward everything that God gives us. Uh, let's see. Proverbs 28.1 says, The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are what? Bold as lions. Are you in Christ? You're made righteous? You're supposed to be bold. Okay? That's an attribute of, of Christianity is having boldness. Okay, here's some, uh, let's see. Oh, wait. Never mind. You guys got to educate yourself, all right? Oh, yeah, that was the first one. You have responsibility. We're getting into the action steps now. I just forgot to mention that. Uh, responsibility is the first one. Number two is educate yourself. You can't rely on your, your school to teach you about your duty and responsibility as a Christian in America anymore. That's just not going to happen, okay? Maybe some public school or private schools are going to do that adequately, but even that is honestly rare to find. So you've got to take this responsibility on yourself. You've got to start doing your own research. You've got to start um, investing into good books, leaders or readers, right? Um, invest into good knowledge about how awesome America is and what you can do to preserve it. Um, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> okay, I will say it. Um, homeschool. Just get out of public school, okay? <laughs> Listen, I, I think the public school system is a lost cause, all right? I don't see any redemption in it. But then again, God can do whatever he wants to do, so maybe. But I just believe homeschooling is the way to go, all right? I was homeschooled, and look how I turned out. Um, <laughs> all right, so... Um, my dad's organization, what we do, Patriot Academy, we teach people all about this. We teach people about uh, how to be a Christian in politics and uh, our Christian heritage in America. The faith of the founders is a big part of what we teach about. And uh, we have a course. This uh, talk is titled Biblical Citizenship in Modern America. We have a whole eight-week course all about that. Um, so I'm going to play a quick video 
Uh, I don't know if we can get the lights, guys, and the volume on this. Um, but I'm going to play a quick little promo for this course, and then I want to encourage you guys to actually go do this whole thing, okay? Let's see if I can get this working. President Ronald Reagan once said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. That statement is more true now than ever before. Well, and so many Christians are confused because they're being told things by, from different people such as, oh, Christians shouldn't do anything in government, stay out of that. It's not what the Bible says. In fact, we're called to be biblical citizens. Biblical principles are what produce freedom of society, but you won't have biblical principles in society in which you don't have citizens with a biblical worldview. The truth of the matter is most Americans don't have a biblical worldview, which means that they have to draw on or they've chosen to draw on other worldviews that are available to them. The further we move away from biblical principles, the further we move away from liberty and freedom. Remember um, in the Old Testament after the scripture had been hidden for so long and it was brought out and it was read yeah, before the that's people, right. the people wept with joy that's right. because there's freedom in the law. Right. I found over the years that uh, the only really reliable uh, matrix to reality is the biblical blueprint. We've relegated to say, look, politics is dirty. That's what pastors say. Politics is dirty. I don't do, I don't do politics. Well, the church is dirty. What's your point? There's so many people today that are uh, educated at institutions where they come out as secular humanists. Yeah. And so there's no fear of God. If you're a Christian, a person of faith, you must care about what's happening in our culture. You must get involved in voting. No, the Constitution is so unique. It is the only Constitution that actually limits government. So in other words, if you put bad people into a broken structure, mm. you're going to get bad results. If you have a bad system, you elect good people to go into a bad system, you're still going to get a bad result. And the founders knew this nation was already very diverse. And federalism allows that diversity to flourish. And you begin to love what God loves and hate what he hates in the scriptures because your heart is lining up with the heart of God because of the gospel. It is astounding to me how many people in America have been indoctrinated into a condition of complete ignorance. I think biblical citizenship as a Christian would be stewardship. That God has given us this republic to be stewards over. In terms of actually having a biblical perspective on things, even in terms of believing that the Bible is a trustworthy document to give them guidance for their future, most Americans are not in that place. As people are experiencing tyranny, we, they're, they're asking why, what has happened, and there's just this feeling of being lost right now and not knowing where to turn. And you just gave us the foundation. This is truth. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, I gotta run through some stuff real quick because I'm supposed to close here in a second. I had another video, but I'm not gonna play that one, guys. Let me get through this then. Uh, let's see. Oh, what? Okay, whatever. This is what I was going to say. Um, you guys are young. Y'all are teenagers. I know it might seem like, you know, politics is a far-off world. I don't know what to do, how to get involved, what can I do. Um, you're not going to be able to run for office for a little while, a few more years in your life, but you can start with yourself, and it starts with education. So just, just knowing this stuff, that's where you start, guys, okay? So taking courses like this. We have another program uh, called our Leadership Congress. For a whole week, you can come spend... Uh, a week with us at the state capitol in Texas, and we will teach you the legislative process. You basically go through a mock legislative session, so you act as a legislator for a week. You bring a bill. You debate it with other people. You're on the real House floor. You're in the actual capitol um, in Texas, so it's really cool. It's a really uh, great experience. You get leadership training, communications training, all sorts of great, st great stuff there. So patriotacademy.com, that is going to have all the resources on there for you guys to go do this stuff, to sign up for everything. Um, and then another big thing that you can do is Applied Life Leaders Academy, okay? That, yes. That will teach you how to be a biblical leader and to walk in the calling that God has on your life, and you will discover that calling in the nine months that you come spend here. Um, okay, so share this knowledge and multiply yourself. Listen, only 3% of Americans fought in the Revolutionary War. 3%. 
Now, there was a lot more than that that were praying, that were being suppliers. They were doing other stuff behind the scenes, but only 3% were actually boots on the ground that fought in the Revolutionary War. God only needs a remnant to take over uh, a nation, okay? Uh, here's another thing. Think locally. Don't think that if we just get the right president in the White House that all our problems are going to disappear, okay? That is not how our government works. We are a federalistic government, meaning that it should be the, the lower you get, the more local you get, the more centric the power is and the more actual influence you have over the people. So this is really interesting. Okay, the first four battles of the Revolutionary War went like this. You had Lexington, um, that famous green Lexington. You had uh, Pastor Jonas Clark and his church of 70 men that went out on that green and fought 700 of the British. Okay, that was a single church, so a local battle. All right, uh, the British have a big victory there. They, they march on to Concord. And then at Concord, you had Pastor William Emerson and his church that fought against the British. That was 700 British versus about 350 guys. So that was another church locally that fought the battle there. Okay. Uh, and then the commander of the British said, oh my gosh, I need uh, like reinforcements. So I need to go back and get reinforcements. So he's on his way back to Boston. And then on the way to Boston, Pastor Payson Phillips and Pastor Benjamin Bolch and other local churches surrounded the British on the road to Boston and won battles there. So it was local churches that fought those battles. Uh, let's see. And then even at the Battle of Bunker Hill, Reverend Joseph Willard had two companies in his church that he brought to that battle. He said, golly, you know what, guys? I got a bunch of guys in my church, and we need to go fight this war. So what's really interesting, too, is within those first uh, few battles that happened locally, none of those guys called on Washington. None of, they didn't call on the big Calvary to come in and, and help them out. They said, no, no, Washington, you're dealing with national stuff. Don't worry. We've got this. We'll handle this locally. Okay, so what we need to do is start thinking locally. Get Christians on school board, county commissioner, okay, mayor. Um, state and local level uh, officials are the ones that have the most influence and impact on your life. Okay, so... As a young person, you just got to educate yourself and then tell people that, all right? Get your parents to take this course, and then maybe one of them can run for an office someday. But think locally, and then as you start to see revival locally all around the nation, that's how you start to see a whole national revival, because then it goes from local to state and state to federal, okay? Uh, that's all I got for you guys. Y'all get something out of that? Cool.